Uh, thank you to the organizers for uh, inviting me to speak here today. Um, I'm going to be talking about work in progress with uh, Steve Schenker and Douglas Stanford about non-perturbative effects in Takiev tidal buoyant gravity. So let's start with some motivation. Uh, black holes are strongly chaotic systems, and so their energy levels should be distributed like the eigenvalues of a random matrix. Now in gravity, this should be a non-perturbative effect. Uh, and so this is uh, part of why I'm uh, investigating uh, the role of this uh, eigenvalue uh, statistics in uh, gravity is particularly interesting to us. So we've been studying the SYK model for a while. And the SYK model has uh, energy levels with these statistics. And it also has, uh, uh, sh it shares some properties with black holes. So the SYK model has a low energy sector uh, described by Jacquave tidal buoyant gravity, or JT gravity. And so motivated by this, we're going to step back from uh, the SYK model and study an even simpler problem, which is just pure JT gravity. And we're going to look for non-perturbative effects in the partition function of JT, JT gravity, hoping that they'll tell us something about this connection with random matrix theory. So here I've written the action for JT gravity uh, in a bit of a schematic way. And so we've got these three uh, different parts. The first here is a topological term. So we've got S0, the zero temperature entropy, times the Orley characteristic of the manifold. So when you get JT gravity from SYK, S0 is proportional to N of SYK. And so we want to think about S0 as something pretty large. We also have this middle term here, uh, which upon integrating over the dilaton enforces that our manifolds have constant negative curvature. And so this is one of the great simplifying features of JT gravity. Uh, we don't have to consider all two-dimensional manifolds, only these very simple ones with constant curvature. This last piece here uh, involves the boundary of the manifold we're valuing this action on. So we can see that it involves the extrinsic curvature of this boundary and the value of the dilaton along the boundary. So this term in the action leads to the uh, uh, Schwarzian theory. So I said that we were going to calculate the partition function of JT gravity. So let's talk a little bit more about what exactly I mean by that. So we're going to define the partition function at inverse temperature beta to be the Euclidean path integral over all geometries with one single asymptotically Euclidean ADS boundary with renormalized length beta and fixed uh, value of the dilaton phi, phi sub b. Now motivated by connections to random matrix theory that we'll explore in a second, uh, we're going to include a sum over topologies in our integral over geometries. So we're going to be able to write down an expression for the partition function as a sum over topologies. Now, because of this uh, Euler characteristic term in the action, uh, each topology is weighted differently by this factor of e to the minus s naught. So we're going to have a sum with g equals 0 uh, being the disk topology, uh, or g greater than 1, where we add handles to the disk. So let's look at this uh, picture here to see it a little bit, little bit more clearly. Uh, the g equals 1 term, we add 1 handle. g equals 2, we add 2 handles. And this looks something like a string genus expansion, where our uh, genus counting parameter, uh, like g string, is e to the minus s naught. So that's something like an SYK e to the minus n. We can see that slicing these geometries leads to uh, spatial geometries with multiple uh, disconnected spatial components. So these Euclidean geometries are describing the joining and splitting of these like baby universes. And so this will be slightly more relevant in our discussion. So first, we're going to look at the first term in our expansion, g equals 0, the disk topology. So the first part in the JT action gives us all the characteristic plus 1. So it weights uh, the contribution to the partition function by e to the positive s naught. The geometries which we integrate over have this constant negative curvature, but we have to integrate over the shape of the cutoff surface. This cutoff surface has renormalized length beta. So this disk partition function has been studied a lot, and the uh, partition function is, on the disk is one loop exact. Uh, and upon Laplace transforming this, you get the density of states at genus 0 with uh, this cinch of root e. So I want you to pay attention to this function cinch of root e because it's going to be pretty important. 
subleading contributions in our partition function come from adding handles. Um, and so here we're going to take advantage of one of the really nice features of JT gravity. Everything is constant negative curvature. And so all the manifolds we will be considering that have this single asymptotically ADS boundary all have this simple form. You can cut these geometries along a circular geodesic uh, into two pieces here. Uh, so one comment, by the way, is a geodesic boundary in JT gravity has Neumann conditions for the uh, dilaton. So these two pieces here, this we're going to call the trumpet. Uh, we take this piece, we integrate over, over the boundary cutoff surface, uh, and we integrate over the bulk moduli. And we also integrate over how these uh, two regions are glued together. So one comment is that uh, we're going to be integrating over all these geometries, not just doing a saddle point approximation. Now this is possible because of the simplicity of JT gravity. So looking more closely at these sort of contributions to the partition function, we can write the genus G partition function in this form. Here we have the uh, trumpet partition function, which involves the integral of this boundary curve for on the trumpet geometry with geodesic boundary of uh, length B. The uh, rest of this geometry here uh, involves the moduli of this Riemann surface with uh, fixed boundary length B. We also glue together these two pieces uh, with this measure, B, integral BDB. The extra factor of B comes from a relative twist angle when we uh, join these two geometries. So the part of the integral that comes from integrating over all these moduli gives us this factor G, V sub G1 of B. This is called the Ve peterson volume of the moduli space of Riemann surfaces with a single geodesic boundary. This trumpet partition function, uh, we can calculate this using the methods of Stanford and Witten, and we find that it's one loop exact, and here's a, the formula for it if you're interested. Um, and so altogether, we just glue this to this, and we have these two, two sort of different looking objects here. Uh, one involves the short scene, one is, involves the moduli space of these uh, one boundary Riemann surfaces, and naively, you might, not, we, you might not expect them to know much about each other. However, we're going to find an interesting relationship. Um, and to go a little bit more into that, first we're going to talk about some structure in these uh, Ve Peterson volumes. So they have a rather rich structure, which has been understood by Witten, Konsevich, and Mirzakhani. In a particular, Miriam Mizukani gave these very geometric uh, recursion relations between the Vey Peterson volumes at different genus. Here I have a uh, rather schematic picture uh, illustrating the general idea behind how these recursion relations work. The basic idea is that if you take a Riemann surface with one boundary in uh, some genus, you can split it up into Riemann surfaces with lower genus. Uh, in two different ways. One is we can uh, cut it along a neck, along some uh, geodesic of length B prime here, or we can cut, it, uh, cut one of these handles in half, uh, lowering the genus by one. So using this, uh, these two ways to split up this higher genus Riemann surface into lower genus Riemann surfaces, uh, Mirzakhani gave these recursion relations, which given this base case for uh, G equals one and uh, the volume of the three-hold sphere, which, has, which is just one. Uh, you can run these recursion relations and calculate any of the uh, higher genus Ve peterson volumes. So to go further, we're going to have to introduce some, uh, uh, a definition for, for a matrix integral. So you'll see why matrix integrals are now relevant in a second. But first, let's get this uh, definition straight. So I'm going to define the resolvent of an L by L Hermitian matrix model like this. We take trace of 1 over x minus the matrix H, and we integrate over H, where H is uh, uh, the probability for H is described in terms of some potential V of H. Because this is a matrix integral, it has a uh, genus expansion and 1 over the rank of the matrix squared. So the argument of the resolvent x, we're going to want to think of like an energy. So this is why I called this uh, matrix H, like Hamiltonian. Uh, and so x greater than 0 is going to be the support of the uh, uh, eigenvalue distribution of this matrix H. Uh, something that we're going to need going forward is that you can uh, obtain the density of states of this matrix, integral of this matrix, uh, from the discontinuity of the resolvent across the real axis. And then for experts in the audience, we're going to focus on double-scaled matrix models, 
But if you don't recognize these words, don't worry about it. It's not that important. So the reason why we're talking about these matrix integrals is they also have some recursion relations. Now, they're often referred to as loop equations, but there's a certain refinement of these loop equations called topological recursion. So what topological recursion tells us is that if I'm given the spectral curve of the matrix model, which is essentially the genus zero resolvent, uh, plus a, uh, an annulus, uh, which has to do with two resolvents, then I can run these recursion relations, the topological recursion, and calculate the resolvent to all orders in the genus expansion. So this seems somewhat sim similar to what I was talking about with Mirzakhani's recursion relations. And in fact, Einard and Orontin showed that Mirzakhani's recursion relations are equivalent to a special case of topological recursion. So if I give you a spectral curve, uh, sine of square root of minus x, which tells me that my matrix integral has a genus zero density state cinch of root e. So this is why I told you to pay attention to the cinch of root e. Uh, then the topological recursion relations are identical to Mirzakhani's recursion relations. What I mean precisely by that is that there's a certain integral transform which you can do. So if you do this integral transform on the genus G piece of the resolvent, it is equal to the genus G Ve Peterson volume. <coughs> Now, this integral transform, I haven't written it down explicitly, but it's something like an inverse Laplace transform. So what can we do with this? Well, we have an expression for the JT gravity partition function in terms of these Vey peterson volumes. So let's plug in this identity here into that expression. So here, we replace this uh, Vey peterson volume with this integral transform of this genus G resolvent. I've written out explicitly the uh, trumpet partition function. Now, the neat thing that happens is that this piece here, the trumpet partition function, which is uh, you can calculate from the Schwarzian theory, uh, combines with this integral transform to make just a normal inverse Laplace transform. We can recognize this inverse Laplace transform of the resolvent at genus G to be the genus G contribution to the quantity trace of e to the minus beta h in the matrix model which is simply just the matrix model partition function at genus G. So we see here the JT partition function is equal to the matrix model partition function uh, in the genus expansion. So to emphasize this again, given a matrix model with this spectral curve, or equivalently this uh, genus zero density of states, and this genus counting parameter, the matrix model partition function and the JT gravity partition function agree to all orders in E to the minus S naught. Beta in the matrix model is defined right here. So I, I'm calculating this quantity in the matrix model. So I've said that these two quantities agree, these two partition functions agree to all orders in e to the minus s naught. And in fact, the JT uh, gravity partition function is really only defined as a power series in e to the minus s naught. Yeah, so this is what I'm going to talk about in this slide, actually. Uh, yeah, so what's interesting is that the JT gravity partition function gives an, an asymptotic series in e to the minus s naught. So it doesn't really make sense as the partition function. Uh, a comment is that the genus G contribution grows as 2G factorial. And uh, this is generic in string perturbation theory, this sort of growth. And so we don't want an asymptotic series for our JT uh, gravity partition function. We'd like something that's non-perturbatively complete. We see that the matrix model agrees with it to all orders in perturbation theory. So why not take the matrix model as our non-perturbative definition of JT gravity? So there is an issue of uh, the uniqueness of this completion. Uh, but I uh, will leave that off until the discussion. So if we just take this uh, matrix model to be our non-perturbative definition of JT gravity, what sort of non-perturbative effects show up uh, when we use this matrix model? And in particular, can we understand these random matrix theory uh, eigenvalue statistics? So instead of studying the partition function, it's a little bit more convenient to move to the energy basis. We're going to study the resolvent, which gives us the density of states. So the resolvent here is uh, slightly uh, technically easier to deal with. Uh, which is why we're introducing it. 
So as a simple example of some non-perturbative effects in matrix integrals, we will look at uh, a matrix integral with a Gaussian potential, sorry, a uh, quadratic potential for the uh, eigenvalues. For a given matrix, these eigenvalues will sit somewhere near the bottom of this potential, but the eigenvalues will repel, and so they'll like to have some average spacing given by one over the uh, uh, genus zero density of states, which is like e to the minus s naught. So they have this very small spacing, but for every in instance of the matrix, they like to be kind of far apart with the spacing, and so upon averaging, the average density of states still remembers something about this spacing here. The average density of states doesn't just have this a smooth form, it has these little wiggles in it. These wiggles have a spacing about e to the minus s naught. So we expect a contribution to uh, the density of states or the resolvent that's like e to the 2 pi i density of states times e. But notice that this is exponential in e to the s naught or exponential in 1 over our genus counting parameter. So this is non-perturbative in the genus expansion parameter. And so if we view JT gravity as it's a 2D theory of gravity, if we th view it like a world sheet theory, uh, these sort of effects, e to the i 1 over g string, are like D-brain effects. And so in fact, these, are, these effects that we'll find are very similar to uh, ZZ brain and FZZT brains in the minimal string theories. So there's a nice trick that you can use with matrix integrals to have a semi-classical understanding of these sort of effects. So let's calculate the resolvent, but in a sort of funny way. So take the resolvent, trace of 1 over e minus h, and write it as a derivative of the ratio of these two determinants. Then we can express these determinants as an exponential of the trace of the logarithm. So these determinant operators in the minimal string theory case are something like uh, D-brain creation operators. So this is like a D-brain, this is like an anti-brain. Um, so what we want to do is we want to take this, exp this exponential and expand it, or, and also this one. So then we get an expression for this resolvent, which here we wrote as a single trace. In terms of a sum of terms, each with many powers of these traces. So this trace of the log might be a funny seeming quantity, but it's simply related to quantities that we understand, like the trace of e to the minus beta h. So here we can get the trace of the log as a uh, Laplace transform of trace of e to the minus beta h. It's also equal to just the integral of the resolvent. So trace of, e to the, uh, trace of the logarithm is sort of like a, a uh, fixed energy boundary condition as opposed to a fixed temperature boundary condition. But the main idea is that we can calculate something with a fixed energy boundary condition uh, in JT gravity, uh, for example, by calculating it, uh, something in JT gravity with a fixed temperature boundary condition and then doing this Laplace transform. So what we'd like to do is take this expression for the resolvent, use this trick here, and then calculate each of these terms in this expansion using JT gravity. So here's an example term where we have four E boundaries and five E prime boundaries. Now we're going to work to uh, what I'm going to call one loop order, where we only include uh, disk geometries and annulus geometries, instead of something with like a handle on a disk or something like, something like that. So what we do to calculate this is we sum over all geometries with these sort of boundaries, connected either by annuli or just with a, have, having a disk capping it off. So this is a, a particular example. Um, so the nice thing about doing this one loop approximation uh, is that we can actually sum up all the contributions of these disks and annuli. Uh, they exponentiate, as in uh, Joe Polchinski's Pultinsky, calculation of D brains. So to see the uh, oscillations that we anticipated in the resolvent. Uh, it's sufficient to just look at this disk term, though the annulus is technically important as well. So remember that uh, the disk boundary condition was this trace of the logarithm. Trace of the logarithm is an integral of the resolvent, uh, and so this resolvent at genus zero is simply related to this spectral curve that I talked about, or also the density of states. So we can take this disk write it like this, as an integral of this uh, genus zero resolvent. And then we can approximate this function as i pi times the uh, genus zero density of states at some reference energy times e minus that reference energy. So putting this disk into this exponential, we get something like e to the i 
And this is of size e to the s. So we find these oscillations that we looked for. And in particular for JT gravity, if we plug in our right formulas for E, we can write this uh, uh, more precise expression for this uh, contribution to the resolvent. So here out front we have something that involves the, uh, the annulus, but here we have this uh, very quickly oscillating piece uh, with this E to the uh, S naught stuck up here. And so uh, notice that we, we might have thought of S naught as the large parameter. Uh, in SYK, S naught is like N. So this is a contribution of the resolvent that's E to the I, E to the N. So it's something kind of strange. Um, so in addition to looking for these uh, oscillations in the resolvent or in the density of states, we can also look at uh, something involving two energies. So this paracorrelation of the resolvent, we can do a similar trick by writing this out in terms of determinants, and now we have four determinants. These two for this resolvent, and these two for this resolvent. Now if you work out this uh, sum over uh, diagrams with the disk and the annulus, you also find an oscillatory part of this uh, quantity. And it goes as e to the i, e to the s naught, times the difference in energies, uh, when the difference in energies is very small. So this is related to the uh, sine kernel uh, function, which uh, is, describes the short distance eigenvalue uh, correlations in random matrix theory. So to connect this to earlier work uh, that we've done, uh, we can take this contribution to the double resolvent and extract this uh, pair correlation of the density of states and process this into the uh, spectral form factor here. You also get those e to the minus i. I could explain more maybe afterwards. It's a little bit subtle, yeah. Um, so when you take this uh, very fast uh, oscillating part of the resolvent, uh, or the double resolvent, uh, and process it in this way, it leads to the uh, plateau here in this spectral form factor. So in previous work, we've looked at the spectral form factor, um, which you can get by uh, looking at this, these two copies of the partition function, analytically continued. Uh, the early time behavior is given when these you evaluate uh, these two separately. The product of the disk geometry on the left, disk geometry on the right. This ramp region is described when these, by uh, an annulus geometry connecting these two. Now we see that the plateau is given by a more exotic effect, which is this D-brain sort of uh, effect. And the extremely fast rate of oscillation in this function is what leads to the very long time scale at which this plateau sets in. So there are still a lot of questions uh, moving forward. Uh, one of the big questions we have is about adding matter to this story. So we've looked at just pure JT gravity, uh, no matter. But in order to mock up a situation more like SYK, we might like to add some simple matter fields. Uh, however, there are some problems if you just naively add some, uh, say, a free quantum field to, these, to this uh, story. Uh, and essentially, the problem has to do with these fields not being very well behaved when uh, these extra handles on the geometry become long and very thin. So we'd like to understand a little bit better how to uh, have a sensible story with matter. We also expect some of this uh, story to apply to higher dimensional uh, gravity. Now this whole genus expansion seems like it might be um, something special, but we do expect because black holes are chaotic, we do expect this uh, uh, random matrix theory statistics to show up in some ways. And especially, we expect that something like this, in the spectral form factor for gravity, we expect something like this plateau contribution. Now, the D-brain construction that we've used seems like it might be able to apply in higher dimensional gravity. So we've only used the disk and the annulus to the order we were working. However, this disk was just the partition function. So we can use the Euclidean black hole. Uh, and this double cone that we've discussed in previous work can take the place of the annulus diagram. So it seems like we can do something like this, a sum over uh, geometries like this uh, in higher dimensions. However, uh, there's still some details to work out. And one of the main questions about all of this has to do with the role of averaging. Uh, because 
something like this uh, connected correlation of partition functions doesn't make sense if you have a fixed Hamiltonian. Here we had to average over Hamiltonians. In general, you can do it average over this time here or an average, appropriate average over some couplings. One issue uh, relating to this role of averaging has to do with Coleman's discussion of Euclidean wormholes. Now, Strominger and Giddings, Coleman and others studied the contribution of Euclidean wormholes to four-dimensional gravity. So they looked at the partition function, the, uh, sorry, the Euclidean path integral for four-dimensional gravity, and they looked at what happened if you add these long, thin uh, Euclidean wormholes. So Coleman explained that uh, at long distances, when you, uh, you can replace the effect of these uh, thin wormholes with, uh, by adding random couplings to uh, your bulk Lagrangian. So there we had a connection between Euclidean wormholes and some sort of disorder average. But the disorder average was over the uh, coefficients of ter local terms in the bulk Lagrangian. Now, we, in our uh, path integral for JT gravity, included all these Euclidean wormholes. Every handle is like a Euclidean wormhole. And we also found that we can describe our system as some sort of disorder average. However, instead of averaging over uh, some t coefficients of terms in the bulk Lagrangian, we find that the disorder average is over Hamiltonians drawn from some random matrix ensemble. Uh, so it would be very interesting to explore further the connections between uh, uh, Coleman's discussion of Euclidean wormholes and what we're finding here. And in particular, we'd like to have a better bulk understanding of uh, how this uh, inclusion of Euclidean wormholes leads to this sort of disorder average. Um, so I have a few more things to say if I have, if I have time. Um, OK, yeah. And there's a 10-minute question here afterwards. OK, yeah. So um, maybe the first thing I'll, I'll say a little bit more about uh, uh, has to do with the role of averaging here. So the spectral form factor in general, say I take the trace of uh, e to the minus beta plus ith, trace of e to the minus beta minus i t h uh, for h being, say, the n equals 4 super Yang Mills Hamiltonian. That thing is just clearly just a product of two things. Um, however, once I do some sort of averaging, say, over uh, the Yang Mills coupling, it's not going to be a product anymore. If I plot this function here uh, without this averaging, just this, this product of two partition functions analy analytically continued, uh, instead of having this nice simple shape, it'll have a lot of very fast and erratic oscillations around here. Upon averaging, these aver these, uh, we expect that these uh, oscillations get smoothed out. Now, what we're finding in gravity uh, is that we get something like this, this smooth uh, contribution of the spectral form factor from uh, something like the annulus diagram or the double cone discussed in our previous work. Uh, so it's not clear here. Uh, what we have to change when we have a, uh, something that's not a disorder average or time average, something like that, to have these uh, oscillations appear. Uh, so uh, in this case, this D-brain construction, having this uh, sum over uh, annuluses and disks and stuff uh, only really made sense here within this uh, average over Hamiltonians. So one of the questions about going forward uh, is how do we make sense of this without disorder averaging, can we just still do something like this uh, uh, D-brain sort of trick? Another uh, thing I might talk about just going forward is that uh, McGreevy and Verlinda studied the C equals one matrix model, which is matrix quantum mechanics instead of just a regular matrix integral. Um, and they interpreted the eigenvalues of the matrix being integrated over as uh, Z Z-brains, a sort of D-brain. And so they had some picture uh, in which the, the space is made out of uh, all these eigenvalues. So it's made up of all these d-brains. And so we'd like to understand uh, if anything of, uh, in their work connects to what we're doing, if there's some sense in which the uh, uh, eigenvalues of this uh, matrix H defining our uh, JT gravity partition function uh, 
are, we can think of as D brains making up the space. So I guess that's basically it for what I have to say in this discussion. Uh, so yeah, we've learned some things, but there are a lot of questions moving forward, and uh, we hope to keep you posted. Uh, thank you.